tonight on Unsolved Mysteries. 18-year-old Brian Nisenfeld set off for college eager to pursue his dream of becoming an architect. Then he suddenly vanished. His boot was discovered several months later. What happened to Brian? It was a scene of one of the most infamous unsolved murders in U.S. history. Now many believe Lizzie Borden's house is haunted. Has a ghostly entity returned from the dead to tell us who committed the crime? A young woman takes off on a cross-country journey, following in the footsteps of beat poet Jack Kerouac. Nine days later, her Jeep is found destroyed in a remote mountain region, and there was no sign of her anywhere. On a deserted stretch of highway in eastern Kentucky, a high-speed police chase suddenly turns into a violent shootout. This man is wanted for the attempted murder of a sheriff's deputy, and authorities need your help to bring him to justice. Four mysteries that have no explanation. Perhaps there are answers, but perhaps there are only questions. Join me for this fascinating edition of Unsolved Mysteries. Every autumn, the ritual is the same. Parents breaking the ties at bind, sending their sons and daughters off to college for the first time. High hopes for their children are tempered by concern that they can cope on their own. Hey, man. Ah, uh, what's up? In the fall of 1996, 18-year-old Brian Nisenfeld left his New Jersey home for Roger Williams University in Rhode Island. He looked forward to earning a degree in architecture. As Brian had grown up, he rarely ventured outside the safe confines of his family circle. Yet he wrote in his high school yearbook that his dream was to make a difference in the world. Now, he was setting off in pursuit of that dream. During his second semester at Roger Williams University, Brian left his afternoon literature class. Then he inexplicably vanished. Six months later, on a serene Labor Day weekend, Laurie Vales and her daughter Chelsea stroll on Hog Island Beach, just a few miles from the university. I noticed a shoe on the sand that was at the high tide line. It looks like somebody just walked out of their shoe. Ew. Oh my goodness. And I just kind of poked the, um, the shoe with my stick and it seemed hard, like something had been stuck inside the shoe. I realized um, there was like a white, very shiny white, almost plastic looking smooth surface and around it um, like a fleshy substance. So I knew right at that point that there was a foot inside the shoe. DNA tests determined the foot and a shin bone found close by were those of Brian Nisenfeld. Authorities found no other remains but could only conclude that Brian was dead. When it was announced that the bones uh, were possibly Brian's, it gave us some kind of uh, relief knowing that uh, he didn't just wander off. But to lose someone that you love so much is uh, very hard. It's a catastrophic event. It changes your life forever. You're, you go on and you're never the same again. You're a piece of what you used to be. Brian Nisenfeld often sought solitude here, less than a mile from his campus dormitory. Intelligent and introspective, he had a passion for poetry. He was well-liked, yet had few close friends. 
From the day he vanished on February 6, 1997, no one could seem to agree what happened. Some believe he may have slipped and fell from his favorite seaside haunt, drowning just offshore. Others thought he might have been distraught and deliberately leaped from Mount Hope Bridge under cover of darkness. But the most disturbing possibility was that an unknown assailant killed Brian, then dumped his body in the cold Atlantic waters. What really happened to Brian Nisenfeld? Largely based on the fact that we have not uncovered any evidence uh, whatsoever of foul play, we're inclined to believe this, this perhaps may have been a suicide. I don't think Brian would commit suicide. I don't think he did commit suicide. There's no evidence of that. There's never been any evidence of that. It's all theory. And an accident, I guess it's possible, but in my heart, my gut, I don't think that was the case. I believe Brian was murdered. To this day, I believe Brian was murdered. In a search for answers, investigators try to reconstruct Brian's brief term at Roger Williams University. From the beginning, his life there was a struggle. Brian's academic career in high school came very easily for him. This was much more of a challenge. And with it being his first time away from home, he missed his family that he was so close to. Uh, and I don't think he realized how much his family meant to him until he actually went away. So I think Brian was homesick. He didn't do very well that, that fall semester, Brian. He, uh, his grades kind of plummeted. Investigators believe Brian's difficult transition to life on his own might have driven him to commit suicide. Brian? But something more sinister may have led to his disappearance, something that surfaced from the shadowy corners of his private life. Midnight, January 30th, 1997. Hello, Dad? Dad, you have to come up here and get me. Just by the inflection of his voice, I knew that he was in a crisis mood. I knew that he was scared. And he said, this kid is threatening me. He's harassing me on the phone. Was threatening to get on campus, threatening to beat him up. He said that he could get to him any time he wanted. And I thought, if this kid can get on the campus, then security has to know about it. Hey, Brian. Campus security called the student advisor in Brian's dormitory. How you doing? Good. The threatening calls, Brian said, were from a student he knew but was no longer attending the university. What motivated the caller, however, Brian was either unable or unwilling to say. You're okay. Yeah, totally. I'm fine. But Brian now seemed more trouble than ever. Brian, let's have a minute, please. Let's talk to you. After he left his literature class on February 6th, he was never seen alive again. Six days would pass, however, Brian. before his absence was deemed suspicious. Once notified by the university, Brian's father instantly set out on the five-hour drive from New Jersey. Well, when I heard that, that my son, you know, that Brian was missing for a week, two things happened in my mind. One, I go through a state of disbelief and shock. And the other thing is, I gotta find him, I gotta get involved, I have to see what the hell happened. Of course, Brian threw him. Nothing's changed. It's exactly the way we found it. These gloves are still here. It's, it's, it's the middle of the winter. It looked like he stepped out to get a soda or go to dinner or something. It looked like I should wait and he's going to show up again. But it was seven days. It was a week since he disappeared, so I knew he wasn't coming back to the room. Brian's parents believe the former student who allegedly menaced Brian over the phone may have carried out his threat. Investigators discovered his identity and learned that he and Brian had been close friends during his first semester. Reporter Jody Erickson wrote a series of articles about Brian's disappearance. Brian being unsure of himself, having some freshman jitters, really seemed to gravitate toward this one student. I do know just from talking to Brian's parents and reading some of Brian's poetry that he did seem to be a young man who was questioning his sexuality. And while I am not sure whether it was an overt homosexual relationship, I do think that there were undertones of that. 
Whatever the nature of their friendship, it abruptly ended. For reasons known only to Brian and his friend. Certainly one of the theories that I've explored is that this former student was going to expose his relationship with Brian, that there were certain things that Brian didn't want his parents to know, didn't want his hometown to know, and that his homosexuality could have been one of them. Was it possible that Brian was gay? Well, I guess it's possible. He would not say uh, what soured their relationship. He would not tell me anything in relationship to the relationship with the former student. I won't, I wouldn't do that. Did Brian take his own life, unable to face public exposure that he was gay? Or did his turbulent friendship lead to his murder? The former student, in my opinion, had something to do with Brian's death. He may not have been actual person to have done him in, but I think he had something to do with Brian's death. We were able to uh, meet uh, with that individual, uh, conduct a uh, comprehensive interview of him, and we are fully satisfied that that person had absolutely uh, uh, no responsibility in, uh, in the disappearance of Brian Neisenfeld. More than four years have passed since Brian's disappearance. For Brian's parents, four years filled with pain and unanswered questions. It's every parent's worst nightmare. If it happened to us, it can happen to you, your child, your daughter, your son, your nephew. It can happen to you. I know somebody knows something. They're just afraid to talk, and I don't know why but they are afraid to talk, they're afraid to come forward. Somebody has to know something about Brian. If you ever find yourself in Fall River, Massachusetts, you might consider staying in this quaint country inn or you might not. The Lizzie Borden Bed and Breakfast. Lizzie Borden took an action and gave her mother 40 wet. So what she had done, she gave her mother 40 wet. Good morning. Hi, Sue. Hi. Welcome to Lizzie Borden. The scene of one of the most gruesome unsolved mysteries in U.S. history is now open for business. Visitors can enjoy an informative chat about the sadistic murders while eating a breakfast of Johnny Cakes and Mutton Broth, the same meal Abby and Andrew Borden ate on their final day. Guests can then linger in the parlor where Andrew's head received 11 unexpected blows from an ax. And after a long day of sightseeing, you can drift off to sleep in the same bedroom where Abby Borden's pummeled body was discovered lifeless on the floor. Some of the guests do try to figure out, you know, who did it. Not surprisingly, most people do not sleep easily. There are numerous reports that the Lizzie Borden bed and breakfast is haunted. I think the apparitions and all the activity that has been happening in the house is a possibility that the spirits are trying to communicate through myself, my staff, or my guests of who really committed the murders so they can rest in peace, put the story to sleep for once and for all. On August 4th, 1892, wealthy businessman Andrew Borden and his wife Abby are brutally hacked to death in their home. Andrew's 32-year-old spinster daughter, Lizzie, was arrested for the double murder. Her trial, however, ended in acquittal, and to this day, nobody knows who committed the savage crime. Nobody, that is, except for the victims themselves and the murderer, all of whom are long since dead. Or are they? In 1968, Martha McGinn moved into the Borden house which had been purchased by her grandparents 43 years earlier. According to Martha, she soon became aware of an unsettling presence lurking in the shadows of the aging building. When I was about 16 years old, I was in my bedroom reading a book. 
and above my room, I could distinctly hear footsteps and the sound of like marbles being played. And it almost sounded like little children's laughter. Shortly thereafter, Martha witnessed another strange phenomenon, this one far more disturbing than the last. I went up the stairway and the window at the end of the second floor corridor just began opening and slamming shut. It was just violently going up and down. I got the creepy crawlies that time. Martha became convinced that a ghost was prowling her home, tormenting her at every opportunity. But who and why? The answer to that question may have come when Martha made the mistake of entering the basement alone. Here, legend holds, is where Lizzie hid the ax she used to butcher her stepmother and father. A shadow, sort of like a silhouette, floated maybe four inches above the floor. I could tell it was a woman. I could tell it was Victorian clothes. I just turned around and ran back up the stairs. That experience really did frighten me. That actually did make my hair stand on end. I didn't really want to tell anyone. I, you know, just didn't think they'd believe it. And I didn't want them to think I was crazy or a figment of my, ima my imagination because I really did see this happening. Martha's own terrifying experiences were about to be confirmed. In 1994, she inherited the Borden house and decided to capitalize on his infamous reputation by turning it into a very unusual bed and breakfast. Using crime scene photos, Martha replicated the home's exact condition on the day of the murders. Thank you. When we first opened, I had hired my staff. Most of them at the time did not believe in ghosts or apparitions or anything like that. And then, odd things started happening to them. I arrived at work to start cleaning the house and, you know, making beds. I was on my last room, which was the guest room. And I had made the bed, cleaned, dusted, and everything. And then I turned around and there was the perfect impression of somebody laying on the bed. The indent in the pillow, in the bed. I, I looked at it for like a couple of seconds and then I, I booked it out of the room. I had to leave, I, I was just, it scared me because I had never seen anything like that before in my life. Carrie was white as a ghost, forgive the pun, but she was really pale, pale. And I couldn't get her back in, not even to get her paycheck. She would not come in the house. Over a century ago in this guest room, Abby Borden received 19 hacks to her face. Some are convinced that Abby is now trying to communicate with the living. Andrew Borden was killed in the downstairs parlor. His half-sitting, half-lying body slumped across the Victorian sofa. Here, employees report seeing a strange apparition, perhaps Andrew vainly trying to seek human form. I was sitting in the parlor and on the phone and this strange feeling came over me, a very eerie feeling. Hi, Sally, it's Eleanor. When I looked up to the kitchen door, I saw what I thought was all this smoke coming out of the kitchen, like a foggy smoke. What the heck is that? There's smoke coming out of the kitchen. And I thought to myself, well, that's strange. There isn't anybody in the kitchen cooking. Why would all this smoke be coming out? No, no one was there. What the heck is it? 
The way it traveled, very slow, very slow, until it got to the sofa where Mr. Borden was hacked to death. And it just dissipated, very slowly it dissipated. I'm freaking out, this is too weird. I was alone in the house. So I know I saw something that was so out of this world. It wasn't from this world, that's for sure. What's going on in the house today in terms of uh, things that people are experiencing and seeing and hearing certainly has a lot to do with the fact that a violent, emotional act went on here. Also, because it's an unsolved mystery it means it's definitely here to stay. Author and ghost hunter Catherine Ramsland believes that Andrew and Abby Borden are trying to tell us who killed them, so far unsuccessfully. Hoping to document the paranormal activity at the Borden house, Catherine and a house employee headed to the basement armed with a voice-activated recorder. We went down there. Okay. It was very dark. And I just simply said... Is anybody here? And we could see that the recorder was activated, though we could hear nothing. It was absolute silence, and yet it was clear something was being recorded. So I decided instead of asking any more questions, I would just see what we had gotten. Is there anyone here with us? We shot up the steps. Guess we weren't staying down there with that, whatever it was. <laughs> A noise from the dead or static electricity? No one knows for sure. Catherine Ramsland feels the recording is the first solid evidence that Abby and Andrew Borden are ready to share the chilling circumstances of their bloody end. As for Lizzie, following her acquittal, she used her inheritance to buy a mansion in a fashionable district of Fall River. Her final years were spent in seclusion, ostracized by the surrounding community. She died in 1927 at the age of 67. But those who work and live at 92 Second Street believe that Lizzie has returned home. They claim that Lizzie, Abby, and Andrew still walk these halls and haunt these rooms. Chained forever to this place by the horrific events of over a century ago. And some speculate that maybe, just maybe, one of them will tell us what really happened on August 4th, 1892. Two joggers in Mount Baker National Forest in Washington State notice a piece of clothing dangling from a tree branch. Honey, there's a shirt or something up there. That's weird. See anyone around? No. Someone crashed down there. A Jeep has plunged over a steep embankment. Inside the car are a passport, money, and clothing. But there is no sign of anyone, nor any indication that someone has been injured. There's a young girl. Well, Mark, what'd you find? There she is. Police trace the Jeep to 23-year-old college student Leah Roberts, who left her home in Raleigh, North Carolina, nine days earlier, without telling anybody where she was going. I found out that her car had been found. Here she is, the, uh, the whole opposite side of the country. Haven't heard from her in nine days. And her car shows up with no sign of Leah. So needless to say, I was really, really worried. The discovery of Leah Roberts' Jeep has only deepened the mystery surrounding her disappearance. There are a few clues. Authorities cannot even say for certain if Leah was in her car when it crashed. Only one thing is certain. Leah Roberts embarked on a cross-country journey of self-discovery. Her friends and family are still waiting for her to come home. Leah is, you know, just a very awesome person. Everybody that meets her likes her. Very personable, great smile. 
But, um, you know, she was kind of private also, definitely. Like, very sweet and nice, but it took a while to get to know her. When Leah Roberts was in her early 20s, she experienced a series of tragedies that would forever influence her outlook on life. First, her mother died unexpectedly. Then Leah was in a near-fatal car accident. And finally, after a long illness, her father passed away. I think that all of those things together had the cumulative effect of making Leah even more introspective and probably more aware that although she didn't know what she wanted to do, I think she was unhappy that she wasn't achieving it. Leah found solace in the writings of Jack Kerouac. The famous Beat Generation poet often wrote about the free-spirited road trips he took during the 1950s. Leah was especially enamored by the Dharma Bums, a story that encourages the reader to leave behind the materialism of modern life. Part of that book takes place at a fire lookout on Desolation Peak near Mount Baker in Washington State. From the last conversation that we had, we were talking about Dharma Bums. When Kerouac talks about you know, being alone on Desolation Peak and and about how Kerouac was up on Desolation Peak, just taking in all the beauty around him. So are you inspired to go to Desolation Peak now? Yeah. I'd love to go to Desolation Peak. She was talking about wanting to go up on Desolation Peak and how she really wanted to go off by herself and figure a lot of things out and figure out what kind of person she wanted to be because she really didn't know anymore. Just three months before she would graduate from college with a degree in Spanish, it appears that Leah Roberts secretly decided to turn her dream into a reality. Leah packed up most of her cherished belongings and her cat B, then took off for Desolation Peak, 3,000 miles across the country. The way we first heard that she had left was it had been a period of like four days where we hadn't seen her and we began to worry. And we called people, family, called friends. No one had heard from her. Leah's family and friends filed a missing persons report and checked bank records for any activity on her account. Leah had made several cash withdrawals tracing a route towards the West Coast. It took her only three days to make it to Oregon. The day after we filed the missing persons report, um, I went over to Leah's house um, just to kind of check through things, see if I could find any clue or whatnot you know, just something to give me an answer. Amid the clutter on Leah's dresser, Kara discovered a cryptic note. This is to cover bills while I'm gone. Remember, everyone is together in thoughts and prayers, and time passes quickly. Have faith in me, yourself, everyone. Remember Jack Kerouac. Leah's note said, I'm not suicidal, I'm the opposite. Remember Jack Kerouac. So that kind of right there is an allusion to Kerouac and that that might be part of her trip. Five days later, Leah's Jeep was discovered in Mount Baker National Forest, 100 miles from Desolation Peak. But Leah was nowhere to be found. There were several alarming and contradictory aspects to the crash scene. Authorities estimate that the car was traveling at 40 miles per hour when it plunged over the embankment. In all likelihood, the driver would have been seriously injured. Well, with the speed that the vehicle was traveling and the amount of damage to the vehicle, you would anticipate some type of injury uh, to the person inside. If there was no injury to the person inside, at least some type of evidence to indicate contact damage that the person had been inside the vehicle. Um, but none of those signs were evident. Oh man, look at this. There was also no blood inside the Jeep or in the surrounding area. Investigators were forced to consider whether the car was unoccupied when it went over the hill. But that scenario also turned out to be problematic. Um, there's nothing to indicate the wheel was tied and then it was pushed off the road. We couldn't find any uh, marks on the back to indicate anybody had pushed it to where it was. Um, if you had somebody driving the vehicle and they jumped out, 
you'd have taken your life into your own hands trying to jump out of the vehicle at that speed. I'll run the plates. All right. Police now had strong evidence that supported two opposite conclusions. Someone had to be driving the Jeep when it crashed, and no one could have driven over the embankment without leaving behind signs of an injury. To make matters even more confusing, blankets had been placed in the vehicle's shattered windows. It appeared that someone had used the car as a shelter after the accident. If you guys see anything, give us a call on the radio. A search of the surrounding area was immediately undertaken. We brought in uh, dogs, we brought in uh, search and rescue, and did a complete grid search up and down the road. And they weren't able to find any indication that anybody had left that vehicle. I mean, there's not even any blood anywhere in the steering column. The Jeep was taken to a police garage and further examined. It was full of Leah's personal belongings, a large amount of cash, an empty cat carrier. Found a diamond ring. And Leah's mother's that's diamond that's engagement that's ring. As long as I've known Leah, she has worn her mother's engagement ring. It was her most prized possession. And when we discovered that the ring had been found in the car, it was definitely, um, for me, it was kind of uh, a bad sign. What happened to Leah Roberts? Was she even in her Jeep when it crashed? If she was, why was there no sign of her being hurt? And finally, why would she leave behind everything that she cared most about in this world? Perhaps Leah did accidentally drive off the road, but survived relatively unscathed. She then would have been stranded in one of the most remote wilderness regions in the country. Leah may have presented an irresistible target for a killer. You can't rule out foul play when you don't see somebody for over a year, but there's no evidence to indicate that that has happened. We did process the vehicle for, you know, your, your typical evidence, hairs and fibers and blood and nothing. You know, nothing to indicate that that's happened. Or maybe the lack of blood at the crash site indicates that Leah suffered an internal injury, conceivably a debilitating head injury. Could she now be walking the streets with no memory of who she is or where she came from? There is a third possibility. Did Leah Roberts, inspired by her favorite author, Jack Kerouac, leave her former life behind in one final dramatic gesture? I can understand Leah's needing to get away and find some peace within herself. Um, but considering the loss that our families experience, um, it's difficult for me to think that, that she would leave us open for another loss like this. It's difficult to imagine her wanting to distance herself from her family for as long as she has. But of course, you don't want to imagine the negative things that could have happened. You don't ever know what someone's thinking in their head. No matter what they tell you, you still don't know. Not 100%, you never know. That's why none of this makes sense to anybody. It's so out of character for her in some ways, and then in some ways it's not. One week after Leah Roberts' Jeep was found, an anonymous tipster called investigators and reported that his wife had just seen Leah at a gas station 30 miles from Seattle. Leah appeared confused and disoriented. But before authorities could obtain further information from the witness, he panicked and hung up the phone. The police are now asking for your help. Leah Roberts is five feet six, weighs 130 pounds, and has sandy blonde hair. She has a beauty mark on her right upper lip and a surgical scar on her right hip. Rural Kentucky, the kind of homespun place where most folks are downright neighborly. On a quiet Sunday evening in October, Bell County Sheriff's Deputy Scott Elder was taking a break during a routine patrol. When the pickup truck suddenly sped by with both taillights out. <laughs> Deputy Elder had no idea who was behind the wheel or that all hell was about to break loose. When I came up behind him, he was driving fine. 
Uh, the only thing that I directed my attention to were the no-tail lights. I caught up with it, and it was a camouflage truck, uh, Kentucky militia on the back. I had no idea what that was. I just didn't know. That's when I made the traffic stop. Good evening, sir. Evening. I'm Deputy Elder with the Bell County Sheriff's Office. Hey, Deputy Elder. The reason I stopped you is your taillights are out. At first, yeah, Deputy Elder saw there. no reason yes, for concern. Both your taillights are out. Both the driver yes, seemed friendly enough, and he agreed well, to take care what, of the problem you know, right away. I'll just go down the road here and get that fixed. Thank you for telling me about that. Sir, I'm but then to everything to changed. Nice. Thank you. However, I do need to see your driver's license to make sure it's valid. No, you don't need to see my license. Yes, sir, I do. And the reason you don't need to see it is because I'm a member of the Kentucky State Militia. He started getting very agitated. Anything. He started turning real red. Uh, he was started yelling. Matter of fact, I get my powers derived from so That's when I caught the, the glimpse of a pistol magazine to the window. Weapons in the vehicle? Yes, I have weapons in the vehicle. Sir, do you have any weapons safety, in your vehicle? Put, sir, do you have any weapons your in your vehicle? For my safety, put I don't your need hands to put my hands can, anywhere. Put your hands where don't I can see them. I kept screaming at him, step out of the truck, step out of the truck, and that's when he threw it in drive, and he took off. I just couldn't believe this was going on, you know? It's a Sunday, it's supposed to be dead shift, you know? I mean, not anymore. Careening along Route 25, the two vehicles were locked in a dangerous high-speed cat and mouse game, when the prey suddenly became the predator. He turned a U-turn and came back at the cruiser. When he stops, I back my cruiser up. I swerved and missed him, and he whipped it back around, and uh, he was chasing me at that point in time. And I was on the radio, and I was telling the dispatcher, I said, he's chasing me. Give me some backup now! And uh, I said, I don't know what he's trying to do. I said, this guy's crazy, but he's chasing me. It was a bizarre scene that quickly shifted from dangerous to deadly, with a deputy now under siege. Dispatch, I need backup now! He's, he's shooting at me! Then, with bullets flying and his life on the line, Deputy Elder turned the tables again. Moments later, he was bearing down on the truck when the driver suddenly slammed on his brakes and jumped from the vehicle. Come on! Come on, you want some of this? Get your hands up! Don't Get you mess with me! Don't you mess with me, boy! Yeah. According to police, a wild shooting spree ensued. The enraged gunman unloaded more than 30 rounds and peeled off down the highway. Deputy Elder fired back, but the truck was a moving target and quickly disappeared into the night. I was shaking. I didn't know whether to, to cry or scream, get mad. You know, I, I didn't know what to do. I, I just didn't know what to think, you know, what the hell happened. Deputy Elder was still in shock the next morning when at least part of the puzzle fell into place. Authorities discovered the gunman's vehicle abandoned in the backwoods. They identified the owner as 55-year-old Stephen Howard Anderson. In the back of Anderson's truck, sheriff's deputies claimed they found enough weapons and ammo to equip a small army. Uh, there were six pipe bombs we found in the cab of the vehicle. There was a semi-automatic rifle, over 9,000 rounds of ammunition of various calibers found in the uh, back of the vehicle in a camper and there was other survival gear and clothing and some food as well. But given the mindset that we believe Steven Anderson has, uh, when you see that type of weaponry, it poses a serious threat to property and people. Further investigation revealed that Steven Anderson apparently did have ties with a civilian paramilitary group known as the Kentucky State Militia, an organization not sanctioned by any government body. His stated mission, to protect and defend the U.S. Constitution from all enemies, foreign and domestic. But according to law enforcement officials, some members can be fanatical and dangerous. Even when compared to the group's extreme element, Stephen Anderson was considered a loose cannon. In fact, a short time before the shootout with Deputy Elder, Anderson had been booted out of the militia. 
Steve was dismissal for conduct unbecoming. His agenda would be to do the second revolution now. Uh, in our opinion, it's not time. Uh, legislative process in Kentucky still works. When that system ceases to function, then it's time for a revolution. Sir, do you have any weapons in the vehicle? Yes, I have weapons in the vehicle. Sir, Was have... Stephen Anderson poised to launch his own private war? Authorities were anxious to find out. Sir, After obtaining a search warrant, they uncovered another huge cache of weapons and explosives on Anderson's property. More pipe bombs, grenades, machine guns, and approximately 12,000 rounds of ammunition. Agents also found a low-powered ham radio transmitter, allegedly used by Anderson to broadcast hate-filled vendettas against the establishment. I can see it now. Joe Petra's driving down the road. In fact, just five days before the shootout with Deputy Elder, Anderson acted out an eerily similar scenario to the actual encounter. Well, Mr. Patriot, I need to see your national ID card now and get you to step out of the vehicle. But, sir, that violates the Constitution. I don't care about no Constitution. I said, give me your national ID card. Well, okay, buddy. I'll give you my national ID card. Scan this. <laughs> Have a nice day, officer. To Deputy Elder, Anderson's chilling words were shocking and scary. I had no idea that he had done that, you know. There's no doubt in my mind now that he had it planned. Good evening, sir. Good evening. I'm Deputy Any police officer that come in contact with him, that's what was going to happen. There was going to be a shootout, no matter what. Steven Anderson is still on the run, and authorities need your help to bring him to justice. It's quite possible that when Steven Anderson abandoned his vehicle, he may have hid in the woods for a period of time and either sought out or received help from people in the area. Steven Anderson is wanted by the Kentucky State Police for the attempted murder of Deputy Scott Elder. He is also wanted by the ATF, the Bureau of Alcohol, Tobacco, and Firearms, for violation of federal explosive laws. without endings, stories that defy our imagination, stories where you may have that one vital clue. Next time on Unsolved Mysteries. <laughs>